So who was Lutyens? Sir Edwin Lutyens is the British architect whose life spanned the Victorian and Edwardian eras. Born in 1869, he grew up in the village of Hursley in Surrey, where his love of the local vernacular buildings grew into a passion and then a career. Today, he is most well known for his country houses in the arts and crafts style, many of which are in Surrey, but his work spanned almost every sector of architecture and also includes gardens, offices, government buildings, bridges, places of worship, furniture, lighting, and war cemeteries and memorials. Of the latter category, the most instantly recognisable is the Cenotaph at Whitehall, London. In later years, he moved into classicism. Inspired by his hero, Sir Christopher Wren, the architect of St Paul's Cathedral in London. But the arts and crafts style was so much a part of his early life and that of his friend and often partner, Gertrude Jekyll, that it can be seen in the depths of almost all of his designs. So let me first tell you a little bit about my involvement in Lutyens. I work for the Lutyens Trust, a charity who works to preserve the work of this great architect and also to promote it. The Trust was set up in 1985 following the highly successful exhibition of his work at the Hayward Gallery in 1981. But my interest in Chawton is twofold. Not only does Chawton have its own slice of Lutyens' vast portfolio in the form of the Lower Terrace Garden, but as the former home of Edward Knight, as I'm the administrator at the museum in Edward's other home at Godmersham Park in Kent. So what can I tell you about Chawton's slice of Lutyens? Unfortunately, not much is known about the details of garden design and Lutyens, how Lutyens came to be commissioned to create it. But what we do know is that by 1905, when the Lower Terrace was created, Lutyens was well known in neighbouring Surrey and he was very well connected. Just how Lutyens came to meet his client here, Montague Knight, isn't yet altogether clear. But from what little evidence survives, we can be fairly certain that they became good friends. In fact, when I visited Chawton just last year, I noticed the fine window furniture that they have in the Great Hall, the spitting image of those used elsewhere by Lutyens, and in particular those installed at New Place in Hampshire, which is only 30 minutes drive from Chawton. Now a hotel, it was commissioned just one year after the completion of the Terrace Garden. So there is definitely more to be discovered at Chawton, and that's something I'm looking forward to helping them with. But for now, I'd like to give you a glimpse of the story that led to Chawton and many other gardens that Lutyens created. So how does the story begin? Well, I've already said that Lutyens was brought up in Thursley in Surrey. As a boy, he cycled the lanes, absorbing the vernacular architecture and became inspired by the works of Norman Shaw and Philip Webb. Childhood illness meant that he was schooled at home and I'm told that he used to use a small sheet of glass and a sharpened piece of soap to sketch local buildings of interest and to try out his own designs. Later, he was to attend the South Kensington School of Art now better known as the Royal College of Art, and he quickly became came to work in the office of architects Ernest George and Pito. By just 20 years of age, he had set up his own practice in 1889 in Gray's Inn Square. That same year, the young Lutyens met the artist and garden designer Gertrude Jekyll in the gardens of Little West Cross. I won't go into the details as there are plenty of people more knowledgeable than me on their relationship, but suffice it to say that their joint interest in old Surrey buildings set their friendship in stone and it became the start of many years of collaboration together. I have this image of Ned and his Aunt Bumps, as he came to call her, trundling along at great speed on the bumpy lanes of Surrey in Jekyll's pony cart off to see some new building site and to quiz the people working there. The 
So what did the Surrey countryside bring to their creative partnership? The very nature of the design of all Lutchins' gardens can be traced directly back to his and Jekyll's explorations of the Surrey architectural style. When I think of Lutchins' gardens, I think of stone walls, water reels, ponds, terraces, bricks, tiles, yew hedges, sunken gardens, deep roofs, flagstone paving, and, as is the case at Chawton, millstones. Be they real or made up of bricks and tiles? Like his buildings, his gardens are intricately designed, well structured and full of details. You also see Jekyll's influence in the references to Italian gardens of the Renaissance, something which she studied in person. Her hatred of stiff formal gardens and her love of soft but structured planting. This is particularly the case in the use of water reels and ponds, as at Hestercombe, and at the Great Ark Sty Mirrors at Folly Farm and Blagdon. Last year I was lucky enough to be able to see some of these gardens that would have inspired Jekyll and Lutchins in Florence. Jekyll says, Whenever I've seen the large formal gardens attached to important houses of the Palladian type, throughout England, I've always been struck by their almost invariable lack of interest and want of any real beauty or power of giving happiness. The true beginning of their creative partnership can be seen at Munstead Wood, a house designed for Jekyll by Lutchens, which was started in 1895. Whilst building was underway, Lutchens built for her the hut, a small cottage in the grounds of Munstead Wood, which was to be her first home and studio. From here she could oversee the work and also devise planting schemes for the various borders and rooms within the gardens. Of any of the borders, the herbaceous garden was the most important to both their creative journeys, as it was used for many of Jekyll's experiments in colour, layout and structure strubs for a backdrop and filled with flowers that would flower continuously throughout the seasons. And anyone keen to experience the harmonious relationship at Munstead Wood should contact them via their website. One of Jekyll's last gardens was for Lutchins' daughter Ursula, seen here on the right, Viscountess Ridley of Blackton in Northumberland in 1929. Now long gone, in reality, it was a fine example of her ideals and of the importance of her friendship with Lutchens. So to give you some examples of Lutchens' gardens with and without Jekyll, according to the Lutchens Trust, Lutchens was involved in nearly 30 gardens without working on the house. This is in addition to his staggering portfolio of over 120 new houses and more than 30 housing groups such as terraces, council flats and garden suburbs such as Page Street flat developments and the Hampstead Garden suburb. And there are some big names on the list for any of our listeners with an existing knowledge of Lutchens. Houses such as Deanery Garden, Marsh Court, Goddard's, Castle Drogo, Lindisfarne Castle on Holy Island and the Viceroy's House in New Delhi. In the early days of career, I think it would be fair to say that when a commission included a garden, he almost always brought Jekyll in to either advise or to actively design. One of his first major houses was that of Crooksbury near Farnham, just a short drive from Chawton, and here Jekyll was happy to offer advice on the form of the garden. Their first official partnership, aside from Munstead Wood, was for the Duchess of Bedford in 1893 at a property called Woodside in the village of Cheney's in Buckinghamshire. And it was somewhat Italianate in style, although sadly no of the, none of the original planting plans exist for it today. However, it demonstrates a garden with an architectural framework, something that Lutchens' signature approach 
in the gardens became, whether or not he designed the house as well. For example, at Orchards near Munstead Wood, the house is laid out in a quadrangle and the interior passageways and garden paths and terraces all lead east towards a vista of the valley in which it sits. At Goddard's, a house which the Lutchens Trust owns and leases to the Landmark Trust, there is an example of a garden structure in the hard landscaping and a house by Lutchens, but with a planting scheme by Jekyll. It was commissioned as a holiday home and place of rest for ladies of small means in 1900 and was commissioned by Frederick Merrilies. Fit for purpose, Lutchens designed a skittle alley inside, something which we at the Trust enjoy very much, I can assure you, and a croquet lawn on the north side of the house outside. It was later extended by Lutchens in 1910 when he was asked to convert it into a gentleman's residence for Mr Merrilies' newly wedded son. At this time, Lutchens brought in a number of older buildings, purchased from neighbouring villages and indeed counties, which were nestled into the landscape of Goddard to provide both a feeling of homeliness and to suit the needs of a country gentleman and his wife, a stables, a garage, wine cellar, but also a potting shed, a glass house. Lutchens liked to add these touches of history and setting as if his buildings or indeed gardens were part of an ever evolving pre-existing landscape. At Castle Drogo in Devon, he did this by adding internal windows, such as those between the drawing room and the great staircase running down the dining room, as you can see here on the right. At Goddard's, it was the presence of older outbuildings, such as the low barn seen here on the left. So, aside from Gertrude Jekyll, who else played an important part in Lutchens' success? His relationship with Country Life magazine and the creation of the Tavistock Street office building for the firm is a fine example of this. In 1890, Jekyll, who already wrote for the magazine, introduced the founder and owner, Edward Hudson, to the 21-year-old Lutchens. They quickly became friends and in 1901, Lutchens designed of him Deanery Garden in Sonnin, Berkshire. Here, large leaded windows draw the occupant's eye out into the gardens, something he was later to repeat at Little Fakeham in West Sussex, where the internal paths and corridors lead directly through to the garden axes. Deanery Garden sits on the site of a walled garden, completely enclosed with no outlook. Lutchens managed to design the house to fit logically on the site whilst leaving the garden trees largely undisturbed, Jane Brown, a landscape designer and expert on the work of Lutchens and Jekyll says, Deanery Garden is an entity, united and indivisible inside its walls. The flowers intrude into the house via a court. The flower beds in the open are only a step away from the carpet. All are united. And this plan of the gardens in relation to the house, I think clearly shows the geometry and axes and the relationship between the two with the house and garden. Shortly afterwards, Hudson bought Linda's Farm Castle, now owned by the National Trust, and asked Lutchens to convert it into a holiday retreat. It was no small task. Here, the small walled garden by Jekyll, far below the castle's rocky outcrop, is the only break from the natural landscape of Holy Island. By 1927, Hudson bought Plumpton Place in East Sussex. However, by this time, Lutchens was often abroad and, as usual, extremely busy as a now imperial architect with projects such as designing the new Indian capital of New Delhi. So whilst Lutchens created several of the cottages and lodges for Hudson at Plumpton, the gardens are largely of Jekyll's creation. Not only did Lutchens work for Hudson on his offices and homes, his work did and still does regularly feature in the pages of Country Life magazine, and many of Lutchens' commissions would have come as a direct result of this. So Hudson was an important benefactor in Lutchens' career. Was there anyone else? Lots. It could be a book in his own right. Lady Sackville, for one, 
mother of Beta Sackville West, she alone is responsible for five commissions and also for gifting Lutchens with this, his own set of wheels, a 1925 Rolls-Royce Sedansa Coupe. You can catch a glimpse of this very car in Downton Abbey the movie. I'm afraid I'm a bit of a car en enthusiast when it comes to the classics. I should also mention this, his connection through his marriage to Lady Emily Lytton in 1897. Through this, Lutchins came to alter the formal gardens at her family of Lytton's Nebworth House, now of Concert Hall fame. He also designed the Dower House there, Homewood, and several other buildings on the estate for the family. Certainly Lutchins' influence from G. Cool was strongest when they worked together at Munstead Wood, and with many of Lutchins's and her own clients in Surrey. Later his work took him further afield and they did less work together. Lutchins branched out into garden structures such as bathing and boating pavilions and lodges such as those seen at Whitley Park in Surrey. But it's important to stress that without Jekyll his gardens would not be the outstanding and refreshing modern pieces that they no doubt are. Jekyll really is the mother of modern English country gardens and without her, her many of what we see to be normal gardens would simply not exist. So to give you examples of gardens where Lutchens did little or nothing to the houses, the big three that immediately come to mind are Ammerdown in 1902, Hestercombe in 1903 and Haywood in 1906. With my background in architecture, I'm not so hot on all the plant names, but I can describe how the gardens are laid out and what Lutchens' signature looks are that he left in them. Ammerdam, for example, is a James Wyatt building. For anyone who knows St Martin's in the field in London, Wyatt is the architect of the fine classical building that sits alongside the church just off Trafalgar Square. Here Lutchens draws his angles for the garden from the southeast drawing room door to meet the axes from Watts Orangery and thus fits this new garden comfortably into the pre-existing setting. Hestercombe is a typical example of the devices used by Lutchens in his gardens, descending from the house, down terraces, each changing in detail but also in vistas. Geometry also plays a part taking inspiration from the golden section and the classical ratios that his heroes, Sir Christopher Wren, used, themselves handed down from the Italian architect Andre Palladio. Lutchen's mastery in the garden and building planning was his ability to choose the optimum viewpoint for a site. To quote Jane Brown again, to Lutchen's house and site should, as in vernacular building, form an organic whole. Just as important was the relationship of the house and garden. As Lutchens wrote, Even the position of a staircase window may materially affect a garden plan. And coming back to Chawton, let's describe what they have there and how it relates to these other commissions. I've already mentioned millstones and these are one of the most common features in Lutchens' gardens. I think Goddard's has around 10 of these. One can be seen here on the right, and they form part of the paving, courtyards, but all the doorsteps. They can be genuine millstones, previously used in flour mills for grinding, but they can also be made up by bricks or tiles laid on edge, as in those at Chawton, seen on the left. Lutchens was a great lover of what he would call a Tudor brick. It's essentially much narrower than the modern bricks and we see it in many of his buildings. It's two inches deep whereas modern bricks are nearly two and a half inches deep and this restored example of a millstone at Goddard's shows you an example of a Tudor brick. From what I remember the paths in the lower terrace are flagstone but bricks are off also often used in various bonds, including herringbone, which is set on the diagonal. Lutchens often used herringbone brickwork to line the backs of his fireplaces. 
Although it's called the lower terrace, the garden is actually on several levels, ascending from the house and towards the wider landscape. It's very angular and geometric, but you'll also see plenty of gardens with circular steps that turn outwards to set a scene, such as those seen on the right at Great Matham. To Lutchens, a view was always worth seeking. At Goddard's, he plays a witty game with pedestrian visitors by making them seek the first view of the house. Visitors are met with not one, but two entrance gates set in a tall yew hedge just a few metres apart on the roadside. On choosing either gate, there is still no view of the house until they meet the central path, located equally between the gates along a curving trajectory. But even then, you can't see the front door as it's asymmetrically off centre. Lutchens love to have a bit of fun. Terraces were not only beautiful, they ground the house into the garden, particularly when a large amount of hard landscaping is present. Jekyll often filled the cracks and crevices with small plants to soften this. However, they also provide a service to the owners. Tea drinking and tea parties were a popular Edwardian pursuit and terraces provided the perfect platform for these. I've mentioned tiles being used on end to create millstones, but Lutchens frequently use them as risers, the backs of garden steps, and Chawton is no exception. The next time you walk around the outside of the house, see if Montague Knight asked him to make any other additions to the house, perhaps an air brick made out of tiles or a panel of tile work to replace a missing brick. Another thing to look out for is the paths themselves. More often than not, these were wide enough to allow two people to walk side by side, something I'm sure that Jane Austen would have appreciated when she took a turn around the garden, albeit with a hundred year gap. Looking at the upper terrace for a moment, which I know Chawton House hopes Lutchens may have a hand in, it's a viewpoint, it incorporates the older walls of the walled gardens, just as at Ammerdown, and the balustrading made out of clay half pipes or valley tiles is strikingly similar to those used at Temple Dinsley in Hertfordshire. Whilst I can't say for certain that the upper terrace is a work of Lutchens, it's definitely something worth investigating. And so to close, we've talked about British gardens, but did Lutchens' work extend elsewhere? Indeed, Lutchens was born in the age of the Great British Empire and he became a Great British architect. Two examples of his gardens abroad are those at Le Voy de Motier near Dieppe in France and also those at the British Embassy at Washington. In both commissions, they were part of a commission for grand buildings. I mentioned earlier Lutchens' involvement in India and it was a commission that stretched from 1910 to 1931 a feat only matched by Castle Drogo, which overlapped exactly. At this time, the British Raj saw the capital of India move from Calcutta to New Delhi, and Lutchens, alongside his friend Herbert Baker, designed the master plan for the city, government buildings, the Viceroy's house, now the Rush to Bhavan, and its magnificent gardens. One of his greatest legacies to the history of our nation and its gardens came about when Fabian Ware of the Imperial, now Commonwealth, Wargraves Commission asked Lutchens to visit France and the battlefields in 1917 to give his recommendations for the design of cemeteries and memorials. Important and close to his heart as he'd lost five nephews to the Great War, he, Herbert Baker and Reginald Blomfield were appointed the chief architects. I say architects, but he really created gardens. He advocated use of beautiful plants and a tranquil garden with no room for gloominess. With Jekyll's help, he created a template for the peaceful, understated and well-maintained cemeteries that we see today, not just in France and Belgium, but across the Commonwealth. And this contribution to the way we mourn our war dead in what are essentially miniature English gardens, with no reference to any one religion, is something that should not be ignored. And I should like to leave you here with this shameless plug of the Lutchens Trust. 
If this interview has sparked your interest in Lutchens, do consider becoming a member of the Trust. We publish two to three newsletters a year and run events and tours to many of the sites that I've mentioned today and more than that as well. Do visit our website lutchenstrust.org.uk and if you wish to support our cause, you can also donate via our membership page. Thank you very much for listening.